Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let's try that again. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. All right, just making sure you're there. Tonight we have the return of Stellman and Green. Jennifer Green and Andrew Stellman have been managing projects and writing about project management together since they first met in 1998. Their first book, Applied Software Project Management, was published by O'Reilly in 2005 and received widespread praise from both working project managers and academic researchers. Their second book, Head First PMP, which is now in its second edition, has helped tens of thousands of project managers pass the PMP exam. Andrew and Jennifer founded Stellman and Green Consulting in 2003, providing project management services and training to both companies and individuals, and have given talks at companies and conferences around the world. I can't believe it has been so long since they were last here. It was 2007 when they were here to tell us why projects fail. They've been working on a new book, and we are going to be bringing them back next season to talk about that. Tonight, we'll hear about beautiful teams. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Jennifer Green and Andrew Stellman. Hey. Um, so first of all, thanks for having us back. It's love. Uh, we love talking to uh, the spin groups. Um, we talked to spin in Boston too, and you guys are our favorite. Every spin opportunity we get, we're like, they're awesome. You guys rock. We're gonna go have it's fun with spin. that. Shout out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. um, so we're gonna um, we're gonna talk to you about the beautiful teams. Uh, this talk is about um, teams, people on teams, how they interact, what drives them, the sorts of things that happen on teams, and specifically software teams. But this book came out a while ago in 2009, and, oh, sorry, can you guys hear me? Am I right? Yeah? Okay. Um, so the book came out in 2009, and so it's been a little while since we've done this talk, to be honest with you. Um, and we, we pulled it out, and we were rehearsing over the weekend and thinking about, you know, how, how to make this uh, more valuable to you guys. Um, and we've, we've changed a little bit since we wrote the book. We've, we've, we've kind of, you know, we, we've kind of come up with kind of some new uh, I, spins on these ideas. So we're going to talk about those too. Um, and it's going to be a little bit different talk than it was two years ago when we first wrote it up. It's and three. I guess it's three, yeah. yeah. Um, um, hopefully, you know, you guys can bear with us because some of these are, are some, some newer spins on, on our older ideas. Yeah, sorry um, if it's a, it's a little rough around the edges, that's okay. Yeah, um, and feel free. <laughs> the other thing that, I mean. We interrupt each other all the time. Yeah. Um, that's just how we talk. We um, like it that way. And so. we, um, we prefer to answer questions in the middle, you know, throughout. If you've got a question, raise your hand and, and we'd, like to, uh, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Um, especially if you see something that's in this talk, especially seems sometimes, sometimes not, but sometimes it really seems to really get questions from people or just get comments. Um, especially, hey, that happened to me. Um, <coughs> But uh, it'd be interesting to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Um, and you know, we have, you know, we know we've got about an hour to do this, but we can make it work. Um, yeah, so don't worry that you know, if you say something, you're gonna run us over time. We're good at making this content uh, fit, fit whatever time scale we've got. This so, is us. Yeah. yeah. So I've, I've been programming since the 80s, um, and I've, once you work with 20 or so languages, you lose count. Um, I've been spent the last 10, 10, 12 years uh, managing teams of uh, doing project management, managing teams of architects, engineers, developers, requirements engineers. Um, but reasonable. You still program yeah, too. I still do. Uh, especially, um, you know, be brought brought in to uh, build up a global PMO somewhere, and then they sort of outed as a developer and get pulled into projects occasionally. And uh, I've spent the past 20 years or so managing development teams and test teams and working with large PMOs and doing process improvement efforts and pretty much everything but developing, actually. Um, and we did, this, we did this, this talk based on the research we did for beautiful teams, which we'll talk about in the next slide here. So these are our first three books. Um, we should mention we wrote our first one in uh, 2005, Applied Software Project Management. Um, it was actually originally supposed to be a book about quality because that's, you know, we're both giant quality geeks. Um, you know, I, I, one of my favorite books is, uh, you know, Out of the Crisis. And, um, you know, you were a big fan of uh, Duran. Yeah, I was a big fan of 
uh, Crosby. Um, and and that, that really drove our thinking a lot. Um, but what we, um, we already said, we always looked at project management as through the mechanism by which quality happens. At least we did for a very long time. Um, when, we, when we went to write our book about quality, everyone said, uh, you should make it about project management because people want to read about that more. Um, so. Luckily, it really wasn't much of a stretch for us. In yeah. fact, a lot of times, uh, you know, the biggest change was changing the word quality in a few places to building better software, which is where we kind of got the name for our blog, um, yeah. which is not updated often enough, but we'll probably will as we um, start ramping up promotion from our newest book. Um, we, um, we're currently working on uh, a book about agile software development, um, and I'm sure that when we come back, uh, sure we'll be back in the fall, and we'll definitely be in full promotion mode by then, because it's supposed to be out around then. Um, All right, All right. so this book, this, this talk is about uh, beautiful teams. And, and beautiful teams was uh, an interesting kind of process for us. We, uh, we had the opportunity to work with, uh, with many, many people in the, uh, that we consider sort of giants in the uh, software building and writing fields. Um, people who we've been huge fans of for years, you know, Steve McConnell, Grady Booch, Scott Ambler, um, and my buddy Scott Birkin, Mike Cohn, um, Tim O'Reilly. Yeah. Um, and we got to talk to uh, Joanna Rothman, and, and um, we give a shout out to Patricia Ensworth, um, who is sitting over there, who is <laughs> really an excellent story, one of, probably like, one of my favorite ones in the book. Um, and, um, and we also, uh, just to embarrass her a little bit, um, <laughs> we, uh, we talked to some really interesting people too, uh, Neil Siegel, the CTO of Northrop Grumman, um, Mark Grumman. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the whole idea was we, we said, okay, there are all these different kinds of software being built using all these different kinds of methodologies with teams that are set up a lot of different ways, and it was interesting to kind of get perspectives on on what works and what doesn't. What has what do teams that work well together have in common, and teams that that are at each other eh, at each other's throats? What what do they have in common? In fact, it's interesting. So the um, and then Richard mentioned the back in 2000, Jesus, 2007. Mm -hmm. We did uh, we did our Why Projects Fail talk here. Um, which uh, is great. Um, if you Google for why projects fail, I think that's the first thing that comes up most of the time. And uh, we kind of started to earn the uh, dubious distinction of being experts in project failure. Yeah, that's not what you want. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what was great about that talk was, you know, we would we'd been talking and we were speaking to groups of over, you know, about about just project management in general, um, some more academic settings, sometimes just training sessions, and we kept hearing the same stories over and over and over again. Um, one of the things we say in that talk is this, there's uh, you know, the old saying, there's a million ways to fail, but only one way to be right. Well, it turns out there's not that many ways to fail. Um, and with software, there's a lot of different ways to be right. Um, one of the things that came up over and over again is that um, one team could, could, could apply the same practice as another team. First team would be wildly successful. The second team, utter failure. They really couldn't figure out why, even in the same company. You know, even the same team uh, it made it clear that there was more than just practices. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so we already went through our spiel about how we interrupt each other. You guys have probably caught on to that, right? Um, and, and we want you to interrupt us. So, so do, nobody has yet. We haven't said anything controversial yet. But we're going to upset you. I know it. <laughs> um, so when we started working on beautiful teams, we thought we'd be talking to people about practices um, that they use in different kinds of companies and many industries. Because we were, we were kind of, you know, we, we'd sort of pie in the sky and we thought maybe we'd get like the recipe for a great team. But we discovered, um, and this is something we've been saying a lot over the years, is there's no one best practice to the point where I've really come to um, really dislike the phrase best practices. And I was, I was relieved to hear other people I'm starting to dislike it too. Because um, if all you focus on is how to do one thing well, you may get better at doing that one thing, but it doesn't always lead to a successful project, a successful team. You know, the higher level goals sometimes become disconnected when you focus on just one practice or another, or even a group of practices. And especially bad when people who just focus on practices, um, and keep in mind, you know, our whole first book was, you know, practice after practice after practice, and how you kind of weave them into a, a sort of a project management organization. But there's a lot of people who've, who've heard it, you know, the assembly line attitude. If you've got the right practices, people are interchangeable. 
Um, this especially got bad. I think um, uh, you know I've, I've talked to a lot of people who were who were consultants, and especially in, in the '80s and '90s, um, where uh, I think it got better over the last decade. Um, but but I think a lot of consulting companies for a long time had had the attitude that you know we'll just throw one resource at it or another resource at it, you know, one headcount or another headcount. Well, there were. There was actually this sense in some of the consulting companies that I've worked with and, and talked to that, you know, we've done this a million times. We know exactly how to how to build software successfully. And I think that there's a there's a sense that, you know, if if folks have a, a track record of some successful projects, that it's because they've got kind of a silver bullet methodology or, or a set of practices that that work, regardless of who you have doing that work. Yeah. So we want to describe that different practices work for different people at different times. A practice that works great for one team can cause problems for another. And this is this kind of, um, there's some contradictory stuff here, right? There's you know, a practice that works really well. Wait, it doesn't work really well. Um, <laughs> what's the deal? We, we've been, been, and our head's been in this space a lot lately. Right, and, and, and initially a lot of people will say, well, you know, if you have really smart people doing really good practices, then everything's going to be awesome, right? I mean, so, so if it's not the practices, then it's the skills of the people. So, so, you know, but you need more than just smart people. Right. And in fact, one of the things we found is um, some of the smartest developers are susceptible to serious and very expensive problems. <laughs> um, you know, the... Uh, you know, the first one, you know, diving right into a project without understanding it. And, and we, so here's something, we, um, the, this is one of the changes we made over the weekend. This, this said, originally the bullet said, diving right into a project without planning it. Um, and one of the things we've realized over the last few years, especially working on uh, trying to helping people understand Agile, which is, which is interesting, uh, really interesting to uh, talking about the different ways people understand or misunderstand Agile. Um, we always kind of assumed that planning meant understanding your project. But, um, and so to me, you know, I think to us in general, it's, um, you know, if you want to, you know, whenever I'm doing training, it's training people on, say, uh, ad, uh, a, um, a, an estimation technique like, um, like uh, you know, Wanda and Delphi, which we love, or planning poker. So it's, um, in, I'll say, if, um, if you think something's going to take nine weeks, I think it's going to take five weeks, we're not really differing on how long it's going to take. We're generally differing on what we're actually building. You know, We might talk about it and realize that I'm assuming that it's going to be like a little command line app. You're going to assume that it's like a big, you know, big full-blown full, full GUI. And we might need to just make an assumption just for the sake of the estimate to get it right. Um, but that means it wasn't about planning. It was about making sure we both understood the same thing. And that's, that's huge. And that was something that... It took, took, took me a long time to realize that people don't necessarily recognize that. And a lot of the agile practices that are most successful with teams that, that tend to work really well are around trying to get folks to understand the same kind of set of goals, right? So um, if, you, if you look at some of the agile practices that have really taken off in the past, what, 10 years or so, you know, writing user stories, setting up task boards, um, the, the notion of an informa information radiator where, where all of your project information is visible to everybody. Setting up iterations where you have tight feedback loops where you actually try to understand, get working software in the hands of your users and then understand what they think about it and learn, you know, not just, okay, we've done this chunk of it now, let's move on to the next chunk and the next chunk, but actually replan based on what we've learned together from actually looking at the software we've built in a small iteration. You know, and then you know, look back at the bullets that we had written, and this is, you know, we wrote these down a couple years ago, ignoring users when they try to explain their needs, antagonizing team members by acting like prima donnas, which, I, okay, I'm a, I'm a geek, right? I, I've been programming for a very long time. Um, and and uh, I, there's a couple things in here where I'll talk about developers, especially sort of being difficult, and I, that's coming, comes to my heart because that, that's me. And I've had to learn over the years how not to be. Um, you know, goal playing, where build, building, that's a classic developer trait. You know, I, I really want to, you know, stop telling me what you need. I know what you need. I'll build it for you. Um, or, you know, I really, I know this new technology is awesome, and I really want to build it, build something with it. And, you know, it's going to be good software for you anyway. 
These are all. So these are things that smart people do, right? Yes. They they get it. They they get into a problem. They think I'm smart enough. I can go ahead and you know solve this without really consulting you too much. But it's you know one common thread among all these things, which we we've made a big deal of lately, and we're, we we um, it's sort of one of the core threads, not just in in what our thinking about agile, but something we've seen in. Can Ken Schwaber talk about it? Can Beck talk about it? It's um, in their books. Um, this idea where we call it a fractured perspective. When I'm thinking about my piece of the project, you're thinking about your piece of the project, he's thinking about his piece of the project, she's thinking about hers. You know, these are all ways to fracture um, where I'm ignoring the user's actual needs. I'm acting like a prima donna. I'm, I'm driving a wedge between my part of the project and yours. And everybody on the project can do it. And the, the more you understand each other's perspective, the better your project goes. And a lot of, and that's, that's, a, that's a difficult thing to actually, even if it's a simple thing to say, it's a difficult thing to get in practice, and it's, it's, it requires a lot. So, I mean, just to recap, we've, we've said, okay, you can't just have a, a great set of practices that, that, that everyone will do and things will be awesome. And you can't just, you know, Take a bunch of smart people and get out of the way, right? Then you can't. Yes. And you, you can't, can't just, just tell, tell a team, team to work together, together, right? Because you know, if I'm thinking about my part of the project and you're thinking about your part of the project, and I say, "Oh yeah, well, I'm totally thinking about you," you know, I'm not. You get we we yeah, <laughs> we we can we can really read each other very well, and and um, and and people are great BS detectors. They want to feel like they're being treated respectfully and intelligently. And that's why they respect people who are genuine and smart. This is an important part that, that we've really had to put a lot of thought into over the years. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I like the example. You know, takes more. Uh, there was a phase, especially any, any of us who lived through the, uh, the mid to late 90s and the dot com boom, there was a big deal about you know, great. Great coffee in, in break rooms, you know, increasingly fancy ca cappuccino makers and foosball tables and and you know, you know, Nerf tournaments and and playing uh, playing PlayStation in the break room. Um, it takes more than good coffee in a pantry to make you make a good team. Although bad coffee in the pantry can coalesce people around something that they're all frustrated with. So. Uh, for us, just to be clear, when we say genuine, we mean that everybody understands your motivations. When you make decisions, you make decisions from a transparent place, you're consistent, and you make decisions that everybody knows why. When we say smart, we mean that you're, you're, you make the right decisions consistently based on real facts. So, you know, you're not just consistently mean to everyone, right? And everyone understands that your motivation is to be terrible, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're making the right decisions. You're making the right decisions based on, on factual information that's available to everybody, and you are genuine about it. Now, those things are values. And values are a very strange thing at first to think about when you're talking about software development and teams and practices and, 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 and methodologies and process. But um, and this is actually one reason we really like talking to spin groups, because you guys think about process. You think about methodology. You think about these things. And one thing that I think has been a really big, just really big um, advance in the field of process improvement and software methodology is, is, um, is, is the idea that, that embedded in a specific process or a specific methodology are values. This is. I, if anybody who hasn't gone to an agile manifesto.org and then just read through it, read through it, there's a lot written on it. Um, that's a good example of a set of values. Um, you know, we um, wonder if it, you know, I, mean, I would say I would say you know one of the reasons why the agile movement has so so much power um, with with people when they first come in contact with it is that it's not just a list of recipes. Do this, do this, do this, and you get software. It, it is values and principles. It's about you know, thinking differently about how you approach your work. And if you look up, you know, read Ken Schwaber's book on Scrum, he has values, specific values, you know, courage. Um, he has, he has, you know, read read, read, um, read uh, XP Explained and Rice Change by Ken Beck, you'll see. Values. Read um, read a book about lean, um, lean, the Shalloway book, the Popinick book. So lean values. It's um, interesting because everybody knows in common sense that that you know there's values are what drive you to do things. You know, 
in, in your life. The fact that you have certain principles causes you to make ethical decisions, causes you to make all kinds of decisions in your life. And, and, and why should it be any different at work or in how you approach your work? Yes. So how do you make a team work? And this is, sorry. No, go ahead. This is, um, <laughs> um, this is uh, you know, the part of the presentation where we kind of mine the information that we got in the book from, from these talks that we had with all these awesome people we told you about up front. Yeah, it's, um, we had to organize, we had, a, you know, we had almost three dozen contributors, um, and we had to organize it somehow. Um, like, and, and, and really, people, like I mentioned, did I mention Mary Beam? I didn't mention Mary Beam. Um, Mary Beam wrote a story for us, and it was awesome. Um, I mean, I've admired him for a very long time, and we all have. We both totally geeked out on him. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, we had to step back and try to just look at all the various contributions and look. There was nothing magical about the, the buckets they fell into. We just had to choose the way to organize it. So we organized it around people, you know, who's on the team, goals, common goals, practices, the specific practices people, people, people um, use, and then obstacles and how people get around obstacles. Um, and we're going to start with people. Teams are messy. I'll, I'll read the slide. Teams are messy. They're full of emotional connections, often between people who are at their wits end trying to solve problems that may not necessarily be solvable. When you have people who, in the midst of a situation like that, are willing to be themselves, put themselves on the line, listen to the people around them, and help everyone get through the late nights, the frustration, um, does that make a team great? Is having a diverse group of people with rich lives out, out of the, outside of the project what really makes a team beautiful? And it's not a straightforward question to answer. And we felt like um, the stories and, and interviews we collect in the book were trying to give you information and, and ideas um, as much as trying to answer a question, because there, there's no one answer to that question. Um, you know, there's a. Uh, there's an interesting, I mentioned Kent Beck's book, there's an interesting, I, I, it's on my mind because it's, we're thinking Agile a lot, um, and it, it's a great book. Um, there's, a, there's a great story. You mean uh, it's, extreme, it's, um, programming extreme Programming Explained. Yeah, Explained, yeah. second edition. Mm -hmm. And there's a great story in that um, about uh, um, when he's trying to explain um, some, of the, some, some, some of the background and dangers or issues that arise around adopting XP, where you have a team that you know, it's a hypothetical situation where you have a team that um, that 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 does, adopts XP beautifully, does a really good job. Not you know, they they're working energized work, meaning that you know, one part of that is working reasonable, sane hours, and they're they're pumping out software that's defect, you know, really low defects. Um, another team in the same company that's scrambling, working nights and weekends, building lousy software. Um, the first team. When layoffs come, the first team gets fired because they don't seem committed. Because um, the, val the company values um, commitment as demonstrated in number of hours over the actual software that gets produced. Um, and that's, that's an example of the kind of contradiction and, and, and messiness that, and that's how, how people you know, interact with each other inside an organization. It's like sometimes they're motivated to do bad work and take a long time doing it. And you know, it's funny, you know, we've said things many times, I believe we've written this in at least one book, that, you know, so some, somebody once asked me, uh, just out of the blue, what's the most, uh, for, uh, shout out to any of the PMPs here, what's the, what's, the most, what's the most important process in the PMBOK? And I, I said, uh, without hesitation, manage, manage stakeholder expectations. And the reason is because if you've got two projects, you know, one project that goes beautifully, everything perfectly, everything goes exactly right, but for some reason, one of your important stakeholders thinks, you know, they expected something that was never promised, nobody had no idea that he was thinking that, but it's not there, and you get in trouble, maybe you get fired, versus another project where everything goes wrong, miserably, fail to deliver, over budget, don't produce anything, but, you know, you, all your stakeholders know you worked really hard for them, they, you understand, understand you, they know that you understand what's driving them, They'll think you're a hero, you know, and that because you manage their expectations well, and it, and I think that's, uh, you know, it's it's. That's what makes makes organizations tick. That's what makes stakeholders tick. Um, we also want to know what makes developers tick because we're concentrating on software teams, and uh, 
That's why we talked to Andy Lester. He's a great blog called The Working Geek. Uh, I think it's theworkinggeek.com. And uh, I love this quote from him. He said, um, I, this, this, is, this is me, like, maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, I was on a team once where I said, at the very least, can we just have minimal respect for everyone else, everyone else here? Um, everyone here? And I was asked quite seriously by someone else, well, what if not, not everybody on this team is worthy of respect? Um, and that's baffling to me as a human, but it's also not uncommon. And that minimal amount of respect is something that many just don't get. Um, you know, where respect is earned by programming prowess. Can you make the most obfuscated code? Can you build the most difficult to maintain style? It's just, you know, can you go the longest without introducing comments? <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, I think, um, I worked with someone once who had not necessarily the best social graces. One of his mottos was, I'll try to be nicer if you try to be smarter. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, That's exactly no, that, try, right? Try to be yeah. <laughs> nicer if you'll try to be smarter. That's the best. <laughs> um, so, um, one of the biggest challenges of working with a team is trying to keep everyone aligned so the goal, so to that goal, so that they build the right software. And even the best teams can have conflicts around, around those goals, conflicts that can tear the team apart. But if you align people to those goals from the beginning and keep everyone in the loop as they change, and they always change, the project is much more likely to be a success. Um, yeah, um, so it's more than just understanding the vision of a project. It's connecting with your users and what they value. It doesn't matter if you have pride of workmanship or fitness to purpose or conformance of requirements. It's a big one for us. Even if it meets the needs of your users, if they don't value it when it's done. So I mean, that's a, it's a really interesting point that, that, the, uh, that the Agile folks started bringing up a while back, right? That, that even if you're conforming to requirements that aren't of value, it doesn't really matter. It's, that's a, that was a difficult lesson for me to understand, um, I think, mm -hmm. because uh, when, I, when I first came across it, because I, you know, I think both of us spent our, I mean, there were, you know, we spent the first, the first probably half decade we worked together putting in place quality practices, quality engineering practices, project management practices in software organizations. Um, you know, testing, val verification, validation, um, Making sure that the requirements chain from needs to to through requirements through software design through testing was was sort of unbroken that we could that we had tests that validated on a functional level and on a unit level, um, you know, there's and when you spend your life thinking about those things, it's it's very difficult to cope with the idea that you could do all that right, do it really really well, and your project could go down the tubes. Because what you delivered still didn't have value to the people who needed it, even if even if it was just an emotional thing. You know, they, they you got the right requirements, you met the right needs, and somehow it just they just don't like it, um, and they don't value it, and your whole project can go off the rails that way. And it's that that sounds like a contradiction, especially to those of us who spend a lot of time and still spend a lot of time doing things like gathering quality metrics, mm -hmm. testing software, writing unit tests. So I mean, some of the some of the most interesting stories that we that we had in the book um, talked about that that issue. We talked about the notion of an elevating goal. So um, Steve McConnell, um, and actually it was in an interview that um, Scott Burke, we, Scott it was a great Scott Burke in interviewing Steve McConnell, um, and those are Scott Scott and I went to college together, and um, we they and I have been friends with Steve and and Scott, who's written some phenomenal books over the years. Both of them have. Um, so it was kind of, kind of unique to us to get, to get a chance to see, see them interact and, and record that. Um, Steve brought up this really interesting point. Um, he he, he uh, said the team leader needs to establish an elevating vision or goal. And he says, um, and, and he's not the only person who mentioned that. Um, if, you're digging out, if you're out digging ditches, that's not very elevating or inspiring. But if you're digging ditches to protect your town that's about to be attacked by an enemy, well, that's more inspiring even though it's the same activity. And so the leader's job really is to try to determine or frame the activity in such a way that people can understand what the value is. You know, that, the idea of, of actually taking that value above and beyond, or you know, the requirements, the quality needs to, every the software needs to drive towards that value. 
in order for your project to actually be successful and for your team to gel around it. Um, there was another story, the Dodge City story. Oh, um, that's a friend. No, that's um, so Mike Cohn. And if you haven't read, um, if if you haven't read um, Agile estimating and planning, um, or uh, especially user stories applied, those are both phenomenal books. And really, user stories applied defined user stories for a lot of us, um, and they really changed the face of agile development. Um, so, Mike told us this story about a team that was that was uh, that was building a, a product, um, and the, and the product. Um, he, they were being asked not to do any unit testing whatsoever. Any nothing. testing, any error handling, anything. If the thing crashed, no problem. Yeah. And so he. And the, and the developers were <laughs> really freaked out about that. So you know, like they didn't want to build something that they couldn't test at all. That they didn't know if it would work or not. So they were coming in at like five in the morning and like and and doing this building unit tests and and uh, test harnesses for their product building an error handling. on the sly like while nobody knew it like in the morning because they weren't allowed to so what that was so mike comes into a diner one morning it's a little late he runs into these guys and they say mike you, you got us help us out you've got uh, you've got you've got a direct line to management here um and they tell them, you know, we've been coming in from you know, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., building all the stuff that we know we have to build, even though our manager told us we don't have to, but we shouldn't. And then we come here, have breakfast, and then go back in like this, like we're just And pretend we got in at 9, right? So Mike goes and talks, that's terrible. He goes and talks to the manager. You can't do build software this way. Okay, so manager says, well, the, apparently the reason that they were, um, the, the project was called Dodge City. And it's from a, a Western where, um, where the, uh, they build this fa facade of a fa fake town um, where, uh, where so, so, to, to fool, the, to fool the, uh, the bandits and thinking that, that, they're, they're, that the town is abandoned or that they got to the wrong place. You know, the, um, and it's because no one was ever supposed to buy that software. The whole purpose was it was for them to build the software Specifically, so that the manager could demo it at conferences and then upsell clients on the more expensive version of the software they actually have to sell. <laughs> um, and it's a pretty you know. Now here's the interesting thing: had he told them that, and they they, it, they might have thought it was shady, and then they could, you know, they could quit or whatever. Or expri but had he told them that, imagine the things you can do with software if it doesn't have to work. <laughs> <laughs> They would have ended up with a better demo and a team that wasn't like totally freaked. So this is the this is the place where we live, uh, practice. We lived and lived for a long time. Um, it's also the place where we've had to do a lot of thinking with agile. Um, so it takes a visionary to see the value in a new practice. It takes a salesperson to convince management to pay for it and to convince the team to do it. And in a lot of cases, it takes an above-average team to be open-minded open enough about the way they work. Um, and this was, you know, this was another hard-fought goal for us, which was recognizing that Agile um, was more than just applying the practices that we already knew. And it, it generally takes courage and open-mindedness for a team to see that they can, you know, that to see that and change the way they work, and see the value in practices, but also see that that practices are more than what they currently do now, but just a little bit better. So uh, we, we interviewed Peter Gluck. Um, he works at the uh, Jet Propulsion, Propulsion Lab in, at NASA. Um, and it was interesting talking to him uh, about kind of development practices there, um, partially because you know the, the software that he is building is going to get shot into space. Um, so that means that the, the idea of patching stuff is, is a lot less possible, right? <laughs> um, it was kind of a, you know, put, the, put their pants on uh, one leg at a time moment for us because yeah. we kind of were like, well, you know, we've always heard, honestly, I can't tell you the number of times over the years that someone's told, told us, well, okay, you could do that really, you know, quality practice there, but we're not NASA. You know, we don't, we don't have to, we don't really have to do it that well. You know, we don't have to, then, so we wanted to know, well, how does NASA do it? And it turns out they kind of just, they do all the right stuff, like, like everybody else, they just do a lot of it. <laughs> um, and I like this quote, because I thought it summed up really, really well, um, the, the tone of, of what he was telling us. 
Our missions to Mars cost $400 million, and your typical business application only costs a million dollars to develop. You're looking at a difference in scale and in cost of failure. The cost of failure of a business application doesn't work quite right as a few irate customers. It can be bad for business if they really get it wrong, but chances are in the nominal cases it's going to work fine, and in the off-nominal cases they'll get some complaints and they can issue a patch. If we get it wrong in the off-nominal no off cases, we may not get a second chance. And, and you know, history is littered with, you know, stories of 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 uh, space lost spaceships. <laughs> yes, you know, convert unit conversion where one team's working in inches and the other one's working in centimeters, and and suddenly, you know, you got a you got a, an unplanned for ocean landing. So one of the things we asked them about is it was funny. It was like a an aha moment for me when we talked to Peter, I asked him if they did any kind of continuous integration. <laughs> he told me that they need a clean room to build their software. Okay. And you load it onto the actual platform. You can't, right. really, you can't really set up a build server that you know physically wheels something into a clean room and sticks a microchip in it. Yeah, so you think about, you know, you, this is really not a case of one practice fits all, right? I mean, the way that they a approach quality in, in integrating their, their software can't be the same way that, say, you know, your average web server can. So, it's funny. Obstacles kind of define a team um, in a lot of ways. Uh, because, in a lot of ways, teams don't really gel until they've solved some tough problems together. Um, and you can kind of tell when you're looking at a team whether you've got people who are used to working together to solve tough problems, or if they just sort of split up, and I'll take this piece, I'll take that piece, I'll take that piece. Um, and obstacles come in so many shapes and sizes. You know, you've got people who can't work together. Um, I, I, in my story in the book, I, I, I wrote a story that's, um, I mentioned a guy who worked for me. Um, it's kind of a, uh, this is a, is a um, oh no, that was, that was a guy I worked with. Who, um, who had such terrible body odor that people from all different division places just walked by. People eventually came to me and asked me to do something about it. Um, and, and uh, you know, or bosses who sink your project. And, and there's plenty of ways you can, you can, you know, it's a very efficiently demotivated team from the top down. Um, you know, problems with buildings and facilities um, leave, uh, Trisha's story had some choice, choice examples of that. Um, and also people who had uh, a little bit difficult to work with. Um, it, was a, it was a great one. Um, you know, bad product ideas, problematic, you know, problematic, and then the software challenges. And, um, and so we, um, we, we really, um, it was a privilege to talk to Scott Ambler, whose who's books on, on, on object-oriented development really helped me out over the years. Um, and he's been spending a lot of time in the team space in the last decade or so. I really like this. You can't always tell when a team is dysfunctional. If there's negative shouting and screaming, that's a problem. But sometimes you can be on a team where everyone's trying, but nobody's communicating, and nobody's reaching their goals. The easy analogy is that during the day, you've got people digging a hole, and at night, other people are filling it up. Everybody's working hard, hard at digging and filling holes, but in the end, nothing of value is actually occurring. And having, I don't know if it means something, but having both Steve McConnell and Scott Ambler talk about digging ditches, I thought, it's got to be an analogy that I'm not seeing yet, but it's, it's, it's kind of cool. Um, you know, one, one specific thing that, that, that he mentioned, other people mentioned too, pair programming, which is a great practice. In fact, I spent a lot of the last week paired with a developer who's diving in on a project. Um, and, and I love it. And, but, but there's a lot of teams for whom it doesn't work for various reasons. Um, there's a lot of failing modes. So Ken Beck spent some time talking about some failing modes of it. Um, and if you've got a team that absolutely does not want to do it, pairing people up, can, that can be an obstacle. A great practice applied to a team that doesn't want to do it can be an obstacle. And OK. Um. So, you know, after talking about all those different kind of uh, stories that we heard and, and how, we, how we thought about it, um, we thought these two uh, quotes from Tim O'Reilly and Grady Booch were um, a good way of bringing it all together. Uh, for me, the essence of getting people to work together is to have an aesthetic vision that you can get them to sign up for. 
where you build a shared vision of the truth that you're building, where you've expressed an ideal, because then you set people free to pursue that ideal on your own. And it's, it, which, which goes back to this notion of values that we were talking about early on in this presentation. Do you want to read this one? Uh, I love this. Um, there was a great, we, uh, we did this talk a couple of years ago at uh, the, um, the IASA regional conference and uh, the software architect, and, and, um, and, and Grady was there. And in fact, we didn't, we didn't realize it until we kind of saw in the back of the room where Grady was uh, sitting there in the back watching our talk, which was very cool. Um, and so uh, this is a fun slide to read out. To back. We read back to him. Um, One of the signs that I have for the health of, health of an organization is that they're reticent to fail. Organizations that are totally anal and refuse to fail at all tend to be the least innovative organizations. And they're hardly any fun because these people are so fearful of failing that they take the most conservative actions. On the other hand, organizations that are freer in failing, not in a way that will destroy the business but are given some freedom to fail, are the ones that are the most productive because they're not in fear for their life with every line of code. Um, and uh, you know, that's you know, the freedom to fail, freedom to be creative and innovate, actually reminds me of one of my, one of my favorite parts of the book. Um, so uh, an old friend of mine is a music producer. Um, his name is Tony Visconti. If anyone's a David Bowie fan, he produced, um, I believe he produced Ziggy Stardust. Um, and he's, you know, if you go to his webpage, you'll see um, just this huge list of rock stars that he's worked with over the years. He did, he, he did an interview with us for the book, too, which, which was, had nothing to do with software, but we thought it was super cool. It was really interesting, right? Um, it was as if give, we'd given him a cheat sheet of various, like practically a, like this huge cheat sheet of issues that, that various other people brought up about software development. You didn't give him that. You said if we had given him Yes, that. we didn't, but it seemed like we had because he brought up issue after issue and thing after thing that, that other people had brought up. You know, just, but you know, specifically about making music with rock stars. Um, and and to, to a lot of really sort of incredible detail, you know, what his, the black quote I read to you about Andy Lester and developers being more difficult to work with is exactly like rock stars doing, being difficult to work with. I'm not sure what that says about developers, but probably something interesting. Um, and um, and there's, there's these wall charts that he pioneered using in the 80s um, that that look suspiciously like we have photos of those, and we have photos of Mike Cohn, who basically invented task boards. Um, and, and, and it's like he's using task boards in, in really similar ways to the way we, we use them, um, except obviously with parts and music. So, on the analogy of uh, rock stars, there's a software company here in town called Creek. Yes. It has on their webpage, what if we treated our programmers like rock stars? Oh, that's, that's interesting. Right, yeah. That's their philosophy of doing their business. That's uh, that's very interesting to hear. That's uh, that fog creek. That Joel Spassky's. Um, then there their lives would be very similar to the average agile team because it turns out that Tony Visconti, when dealing with actual rock stars, uses a lot of agile techniques to, to keep them to do their stuff. Yes, the, um, it's 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 really it was actually kind of eerie, and it it was, a, it was a really good lesson to learn. Yeah, Andrew's describing the task boards. We actually had Mike Cohn the guy who kind of invented task boards in, in Agile project management, take a couple pictures of some task boards that he'd used in the past, and he sent them to us. And we also had Tony Visconti, the, the producer, take a couple pictures of the task boards that he uses to you know, divide up tasks that need to be done on a uh, you know, musical recording, and they look exactly alike. Yeah. It's pretty much the exact same thing. It's, it's pretty impressive. Um, the, uh and I guess the one lesson to learn is that, you know, the few lessons, one, think outside the box in terms of practices, um, that when you have to get a group of people together to work and build something that has never been built before, is how many industries do we really build things that have never been built before? And that's, that's one of the things that's, that's difficult about software engineering, that's, that's different about software engineering, right? You know, we, you'll hear analogies to to, to uh, production lines, and there's definitely some very good analogies there and very good lessons we've learned, especially the lean, part, the lean folks have done that, you know. Uh, or analogies to, to building, you know, we've made analogies to building houses. Um, but there are very few things in the world where you have to build, have a team get together and build a completely unique product in an orderly way. And, and have them be able to continue to build new unique, new unique products that have never been built before. That's, 
that makes our industry kind of special. And, and, it, and it, when you think about it from that perspective, the, the problems we have to solve and the problems a producer has to solve in getting a group of, of musicians to create music, that, that, that's an actual real finished product. There's a lot of technical stuff that has to go into it. But it, it has to be innovative, and it has to be, for them, cool. You know, that's, those problems aren't actually all that far apart. And I think that's interesting. I think there's something to learn from that. So the last slide is uh, all about selling stuff. Um, but um, <laughs> but we'd really like to, to hear what you guys think after, after all that. We just threw a lot of big ideas out. What do you guys think? Question. I don't know if I've ever been to, or maybe not ever, in the last two years, I haven't been to a presentation about teens where they didn't use the word culture. Huh. And, I mean, I, I was hearing elements of culture and what you were saying, but um, I don't know. Well, so, okay, so. For, for, so for anyone who hasn't heard, didn't hear it, so she was um, bringing up a, a, probably a very valid point. Evan, he's going to a presentation about teams that didn't use the word culture. And I could see how that would almost be like going to a, going to a, um, uh, a, a presentation about, uh, about, about um, you know, software design without hearing the word object or something. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so I, I feel like it's kind of implied. In other words, I mean, do you, do you disagree? So I haven't thought about it much, mm -hmm. but we don't talk about culture much, and I think part of the reason, so we've spent a lot of our time, a lot of our, you know, a lot of our lives at one point, institutionalizing things, you know, institutionalizing practices. We're big, we've been big fans of the CMM for a very long time, highly misunderstood. Um, <laughs> I, I, I went to Carnegie Mellon, I know a lot of, I've known a lot of guys over the years over the, uh, on the CMM team, and, and, um, and institutionalization of practices is, in a way, permanently altering the culture of an organization. And I would say, I would say when we start talking about values, principles, when we start talking about, you know, elevating goals, that's all about setting up a culture within your team that values this over that. But right? the, those two things are, in a lot of ways, kind of contradictory, almost at loggerheads, right? Like, is this a set of, of, of specific and generalized practices that, are, that, that you can actually say audit against, maybe? Or is this something messy and, and, and people-oriented that, that's, that's involved in the team? I think that's, that, 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 that's, that's specific to the people on that team. And I, I, guess, um, I, guess we've, um, I guess we tend to do work with the building blocks of culture rather than trying to talk about culture top down because it's, I think it's real hard. I mean, maybe that's, I'm guessing that maybe one explanation is it's very hard, very hard to build a culture from the top down um, it almost has to grow from everybody kind of knowing what they're doing and, and, and helping each other. You know, like, like, um, like you know, some of the best books about culture, um, Peopleware, my favorite book about, about team culture. Or, you know, like, like stories about like, like the, uh, there was that, um, like, like the Skunk Works project, the original, the sr 71s project, where, where it's a classic, classic team culture project. Um, those... Everything is about ground up. You can't you can't impose culture from the top down. It just it just doesn't doesn't work. So I guess I guess that's probably why we haven't talked about it much because everything we've talked about has been about examples and bottom up. But this is a really good question, and it might be a might be a gap that we should address. Now we're gonna end up sitting and talking about this for a couple okay. hours. Good work. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on you know so there? You, know, you have one team, but what about uh, an effort that involves multiple teams, a larger swath of the organization, where you're trying to get people around, aligned around a common goal? They may have different practices. They may have somewhat divergent goals at different levels of the organization. That's okay. So getting right. So that's, that's a good following question. The um, question was about about um, what happens when you've got multiple teams across the organization that might have different practices and different goals, and you kind of got to align them to work together. So that's. It's easily one of the hardest problems to solve in, in, in software engineering, um, I think. And I have, it, it's, a, it's a tough one, right? Um, I can, you know, there's, I can, point, I can point to a couple of people who've written good things about it. I thought, you know, Ken Schwaber took a stab in it in his uh, in Agile Project Management with Scrum, talking about Scrum with Scrums. I think that, uh, I like that, I think Alan Shalloway talks a little bit about it in his book on Lean. Um, and I, I know that, um, 
I know that um, uh, you know even going by Watt Humphrey in, in managing the software, uh, managing so managing software organization. This is a great book from twenty years ago, but I don't think any of that does it justice, right? Because um, you have to get in a lot of ways. You have to def you know there, you can take the approach of defining specific touch points. Um, but it's way too easy to fall into the uh, contract negotiation attitude, and we tend to value, you know, um, co and collaboration. And yeah, yeah, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. The, and the, you want to explain the contract negotiation attitude? I mean, you, you explain that better than I do. I think. I'm not sure that answers your question. I mean, I I think that. Um, I think well, I we do. That is, it's hard. Well, you know, <laughs> it is, right? It's right. I think I think we always think about it in terms of the individual's kind of kind of um, relationship with the bigger animal, right? And and I mean, groups are made up of individuals, and if all of those individuals kind of have a common sense of purpose, a culture tends to evolve from so, that. And, and so here's so here's what I so I've I've spent the last I don't know I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years setting up say like global PMO across a you know global organization around around 100 people or so so not that I know you've tackled larger organizations than that but that's that's about where I've been max, maxed out over the last couple of years um, and one of the things that I like to do um, is. Uh, um, I like to set up when I when I have project managers from the various teams that have to work together. I like to find um, find a friendly time, usually in the afternoon. I like Friday afternoons for this, and I set up what I, an STS session. Uh, if you don't mind me working with a shoot the shit session, where I'll just bring this you know PMO the, the project managers in to just talk about what went wrong in a kind of a safe a safe zone. Um, and and it'll, you know, a lot of times we just won't meet, right? Because something has come up. Someone, you know, or two people will meet, three people will meet instead of the whole group, and it's cool, right? And I, I kind of I like, um, especially when I'm kind of in coaching mode, I like to do that because I like to. Um, I find that the best way to um, get across those boundaries, because it really is practice boundaries, goal boundaries, is to get people talking. You know, seeing people, seeing seeing the people you work with. As as a um, as person, rather than as an SLA, you know, as, a, as an agreement that we will provide this software on this date because we're this dependency. Just just having that personal thing, you know, just seeing the people as people, makes a huge difference. I've turned, you know, I I, I went um, I, I I about five years ago, I had a um, an engagement as, as managing a team of uh, this was a, a team of about eight or so. So I was uh, developers, architects, testers, um, and um, it was a small software company. It was a great group of people. I loved that company and our client. I, I ended up really liking the people there. Um, but my first, my second day on the job, the 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 um, the guy who's in charge of the PMO for the client pulls me into his office. I'm like, Hey, I'm Andrew. And he starts yelling at me like at the top of his lungs. He's a very he was a very imposing guy, very big, tall guy, great guy. I love that guy. Um, but at the time, I didn't know, I just met him, and he started, and he brings in one of his project managers, and she starts yelling at me at the top of her lungs. And then for the next hour, two other project managers come in, they all take turns yelling at me at the top of my lungs. And I'm thinking, okay, well, well what am I, and just, I kind of have to, you know, close your eyes and think of your billing rate, right? Like, this, what's, <laughs> um, and, and by the end, um, when I left, when I left that job, I actually left it to um, to we just gotten the contract to write it for C sharp, and I left that job. And spent the next nine months just writing, um, and they were sad to see me go. I was sad to leave. They were great people. That was great. My my team was great. The client was great, and and the way I feel like I helped turn that relationship around was just by talking to people and seeing them as trying to break down that contract attitude, which is very hard when you have an actual contract. But I, I would say that, 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 that attitude of valuing collaboration, especially customer collaboration, over contract negotiations is probably the best advice I would have to, for tackling that problem. I think I saw. And, and recognizing that, to me, one important thing to the question that you asked, and I'm sorry, we're talking about it forever, um, <laughs> is is that it's not necessarily great to have everybody working exactly the same way. 
I, I think that I think that as long as people kind of understand what they're what they're trying to build, they get what they're trying to do. Uniformity isn't necessary. It's what okay for people to approach things differently. There was a project that uh, is, a, is an example. This is a uh, Boeing Dreamliner 777. They hustled it out to 30 countries with different cultures and different whatever, different measurements. And it worked out great because uh, it was three years late. And it took them quite a while to figure out some of the, the most basic things. And the only thing that saved them was the AS380. Uh, the, um, Airbus 380 had the same problem and they all survived it. But it, as a case study, the sort of how not to do certain things, I think that's the best one that I've come for us. Thanks. There was a question in the back. Yeah, in the back. Yes. Can you talk about the skeleton earlier? Yeah. Can you use different passports for different rock stars? That's a good question. The question is, this, this uh, Tony was kind of used different, different task boards for different rock stars. And I can actually say, yeah, uh, he does. Because uh, um, I was, uh, uh, he, had a, um, he had a studio, uh, I believe this was, so he was working on, I think he was working at Heathen at the time, and he was also working on an album for my friend Christine Young, who was, uh, I believe she was just about to start touring with Morrissey. Um, and he had a studio space at Philip Glass's uh, Broken Glass Studio, and I was up there sort of hanging out and watching him do some See, engineering. Andrew's like a pseudo rock star. Um, and uh, and um, and you could see on the wall, like like Christine's chart looked very different from 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 the David Bowie chart, and then she had like little stars on it and hearts and things. But um, I, I think um, I think that you have to. Tony is first of all is. is a, like the most down-to-earth person I've, I know, practically. And he he's really good at um, working with people in the way they want to be worked with. And he's had to, you know, he's, if, if you, if you, he's got some videos, of, uh, interviews of them out there, and, and he's, he's talked about how, um, how I mean, working with some difficult people. And I think that, um, not in our book, but I believe I've seen interviews of them where he's talked about working with uh, 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 Bolin, like the T-Rex, and, um, and they some some of the things from that era were very very difficult for very brilliant people. And I think you have to he's, he's had to learn to adjust to the way other people work over time. I think there's a there's a really good lesson for that for, for us in that too. Oh yeah, another uh, question. What about the situation where you're you're creating software, but the problem is not with the the problem is more with the business process and how they're doing things, and it's not just a matter of that what software you're building. But That's okay. So um, the question was, what happens when you're working with a business, building software, a business, and the business process is messed up? They uh, they they're they're doing things inefficiently, poorly. They don't even realize they've got problems on the business side before they even hit the software. Um, you know who? Th I I, I um, it might just be because I've been thinking a lot about value stream mapping lately. Um, because they have to. Doesn't vote. everybody? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and Alan Shalloway, in his book on Lean, um, talks about that. And I know the Pop Index also addressed this. And I think that of, of all the stuff I've read um, that resonates with me, with, with the, the stuff I've done in the past, um, I think that the Lean folks and looking at value across the whole organization, where the software team can actually help the business um, find those inefficiencies is sort of a best case scenario. That's hard. Especially if you're in a consulting in a consulting environment, but I you know I've we've both worked in organizations um, where there is a sort of a very big balance of power imbalance uh, between the business and the software engineering people, and and it's still possible to make great software, but in a lot of ways, if you've got a dysfunctional organization, it's it's going to be real hard to deliver something of value, and I think that. I don't know. I think um, I think that the, the delivering something of value is the way. Thinking about what it means for something to be valuable. I don't know. What do you What do you think? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say trying to figure out what the value proposition is, trying to figure out what they actually need, and and, and a lot of it is personal relationship management um, to start to at least 
if you can't address the organization, at least you can deliver something of value and help them realize that so that you're a little bit sheltered from it. I don't know, that's a tough one. Well, I think that's that's about as much time as we wanted to uh, yeah. spend. Um, I think this is the this is the um, raffle drawing part of the evening. First, a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks so much for having us. This is great. Okay, one more round of applause for Selma Green. Thank you for coming. Please uh, join us again in September. Volunteer your time and services. We'd appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Any suggestions for speakers, topics? Let us know. Thank you again.